everyone. Uh, my name is Karen Garth. I'm a communications manager uh, here at Alberta Innovates. Um, I'm going to kick things off with the land acknowledgement um, and then uh, I'll pass you over uh, for the rest of the webinar. Um, we acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis and Inuit who've lived here and cared for these lands for generations. We are grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are still with us today and those who have gone before us. Alberta Innovates respectfully acknowledges that we are still situated that we are situated on traditional territory of the Treaty 6, Treaty 7, and Treaty 8 First Nations, home to Métis settlements. The Métis Nation of Alberta, comprising of Districts 5 and 6 in Calgary, 8 in Devon, 9 and 10 in Edmonton, and District 12 in Vegreville, within the historic Northwest Métis homeland. We respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. I'm just going to pause for a sec um, and ensure that um, everyone is admitted to the meeting. Um, and then um, before I pass it over to Io, who will be your host for today, I'd just like to take care of a few housekeeping items. Today's session will consist of a presentation followed by time for questions at the end. Please feel free to use the Q&A function to ask questions throughout the presentation. Uh, we'll work to get through as many questions as we can once the presentation is complete. Thanks and enjoy the webinar. Take it away, Io. Oh, OK, great. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Io Ailea. I'm the Director of Capital Access at Alberta Innovate, and I will be your host for today. And I'm happy to welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, but before we start, I would like to uh, give an overview of what this is and why we're doing it. Um, as part of our capital access initiative at Alberta Innovates, uh, we've identified three critical pillars uh, of which education is one of them. So uh, following a very successful fundraising intensive, uh, I believe that was March um, earlier this year, um, kudos to, to the team that, that came in to uh, facilitate that, that uh, session. It was very successful. Um, what we decided to do now is to roll out a series of uh, webinars called the Capital Access Webinar Series uh, to equip you with the knowledge, the tool set, and the mindset uh, to successfully uh, navigate the private investment landscape. So <clears throat> today we'll be discussing an important topic, uh, which I believe resonates with a lot of founders, and that's what's my company worth and how do I figure it out? Um, Recently, I was speaking with a founder who um, was having a conversation with an investor. And of course, you know, it's a very common question from an investor. OK, so uh, what's your company valuation? And, and the founder said, well, my, my company is worth five million. And the investor smiled and asked, how did you arrive at that number? Um, now, that's a five million dollar question, right? And I'm very sure that that's the scenario that a lot of uh, founders have actually experienced and walked through. Um, in this instance, the founder said, well, it's, it just feels right. It feels like the right number based on uh, how much I've put into this business, based on the market potential, uh, but really couldn't convincingly answer that question to the investor. And of course, um, I believe you know what the rest of the meeting uh, would have been. So. Um, Here's the thing. It wasn't because the founder's idea wasn't valuable or the market potential wasn't convincing. It was simply because valuation isn't about how it feels right to you. It's about what makes sense to everyone at the table and everyone that you're looking to bring in to buy into, into your vision. So today we're going to hear from our incredible speaker who is going to demystify the concept of valuation, how to think about valuation, how to communicate it effectively. And another very important point that a lot of people overlook is how to use it to build trust with investors and partners. 
Uh, so the conversation today will cover more pre-seed C-stage funding rounds since we have critical mass of our clients in our border uh, in those stages. Nonetheless, it will be very relevant to everyone, um, even at later stages, service providers, um, investors, and everyone around in the ecosystem supporting uh, founders. So um, let's dive in. I think that's enough from me. Um, as I introduce our speaker, Brian Slocco, uh, who is the founding partner and managing partner at Metiquity Ventures, uh, a Calgary-based $10 million venture fund uh, specialized in early stage pre-seed tech investments across Alberta and the prairies. Um, some of the companies they've invested in, and I'm sure these names will resonate with you as well, uh, include Withwell, uh, Cashew, Aerolytics, and most recently, Black Owl Systems. I'm particularly impressed by the fact that Metiquity leads rounds, which is a huge gap in the ecosystem, and I'm really happy that um, that's something that they step in to do. Um, Metiquity's co-founder, uh, Jacques, was recently awarded the Start Alberta Investor of the Year Award. So that's also a testament to the great work that the fund does in our ecosystem. So bringing it back to Brian now. Brian holds the CFA designation and has a ton of experience in structuring deals. I have to say I've had multiple conversations with Brian. He's, he's an amazing person to speak with. Uh, he's got a ton of experience um, setting valuations and providing valuable guidance to companies, especially around capital and investment strategies. And that's all from me. Over to you, Brian. All right. Thanks, Ayo. Um, I'll just share my screen here. And there we go. Yeah, thanks for that introduction. So, uh, like Ayo said, um, you know, Jacques and I have been focused on investing primarily in Alberta for about four years now out of our fund. And uh, this pre-seed stage, we'll, we'll talk a bit about what that means exactly. But that's that's pretty much our exclusive focus. And we lead those rounds, which means we're the one that's out there uh, leading the discussions around valuation and deal structure. So this is what we do. Uh, we do it full time and we've been doing it for a while. So hopefully, uh, you know, I've gained some some great insights to share with you over the last several years and and we'll get into that today and so again we are really talking about uh in my language the pre-seed stage which is the earliest stages of of um of raising capital uh that would typically come after maybe you've raised some friends and family money uh, but we'll get into that and, and what that means uh in, in a few slides so um before i get into uh, detail just a, a little bit of context for uh for the feedback that I'm going to give you. I would say that, you know, just keep in mind, this is a, a general discussion. There's no, there's no hard and fast rules for this. There's always exceptions to the things that I'm going to talk about. And I'll give you some ideas around where those exceptions may lie, but just, uh, you know, don't take everything that I say is written in, in, in stone. Um, Cause that certainly isn't the case, but it will give you a good idea of how we approach things and how we feel that the, the market is uh, shaping up today. We are talking about Alberta, uh, the pre-seed stage, Everywhere you go around the world, the pre-seed stage generally is a very local market. This isn't Silicon Valley. It's not Toronto. It's not Vancouver. The dynamics that are at play here in Alberta um, as a younger emerging ecosystem are different. You know, if you're in Saskatchewan or Manitoba, I'd say those dynamics are, are probably pretty similar. Um, but it is a very local market, and we need to keep that in mind when we think about valuation and, and raising capital. So for me, pre-revenue... Uh, is going to mean a company that ideally has a minimum viable product version built, uh, might have zero revenue, that's okay, um, but typically going to have less than about $250,000 in, in revenue. Um, and that's how we look at pre-seed. Different people will define that differently, but just keep that in mind for this conversation because that's when we're out seeing founders, that's typically where most fit in that range, the ones that are out uh, raising money. Typically teams of one to three founders, maybe a contractor or two to help move things along. For the most part, first-time founders. Again, we have a lot of first-time founders in Alberta, and that's important when it comes to valuation discussion, and we'll touch on that later. Uh, and again, our focus uh, is primarily on B2B software companies. So um, what I talk about is going to have that focus in mind. It doesn't mean it's not relevant if you've got a big hardware component or if you're a consumer marketplace, but uh, there are some different things to, to consider. 
And why are we talking about valuation is probably because you're thinking about raising money. And so if you're going to raise money at the pre-seed stage, you're typically going to be out and raising between 250,000 and $1 million. It'll be the first, you know, meaningful raise that you've, that you've, um, that you've gone for, and maybe you've raised a bit of friends and family money, a little bit of angel money, but uh, this is the first real raise. And your goal, again, like most startups, is to grow quickly. And so when we get into talking about um, some of the rules of thumb and some of the trends, again, that's we're not talking about slow growth businesses here. We're talking about you know software startups that want to move fast. So what is the pre-seed stage? Um, so if we focus on this area here where this red star is, we're in the earliest days, stages of company development. Like I said, we're past the idea stage for this context today. Uh, minimum viable product version is built, but uh, you know, as you can see with all these ups and downs and your founders, you understand it's a roller coaster ride. We're still figuring a lot of things out. Um, we have less than that two hundred fifty to five hundred thousand dollars in revenue. We're searching for feedback from the market on our product and our customers. That's really where. Our valuation discussion is going to focus today is around this pre-seed stage. We'll also touch on seed, which follows the pre-seed stage. You might be closer to $750,000 or a million in revenue at that stage. Uh, and then there's a third stage of, of, of seed we'll touch on as well before you get into that sort of venture capital treadmill of series A, B, C, and beyond. We're not going to focus on, on that. I have a little bit of information that can give you a bit of insights on what things look like in that stage of the market, but we're really going to focus way back here on pre-seed because it's it's probably the most mysterious. Uh, there's not a lot of data. It's more of an art than it is a science, and so it's something that we need to talk about uh, for sure. So why do pre-seed valuations matter? And again, in the context of Alberta and you hitting the street and going to talk to potential investors, I guess the, the one thing I want to make sure you leave this understanding is raising money is it's, it's really hard especially in Alberta we have a lot of wealth that was generated from oil and gas it was generated from real estate um, it doesn't have a lot of experience investing in our technology ecosystem so that means that founders uh, excuse me investors aren't going to be necessarily familiar or have a lot of expertise uh, in what it is that you're doing right and that's important because like I said earlier pre-seed rounds are filled by local investors. It'd be very unusual for you to be here in Calgary or Edmonton, fly to New York or Toronto or somewhere else and find an investor to uh, participate in your pre-seed round. It happens, it's just not, it's not common. Um, and so what all this means, again, it's hard because we're talking to a younger uh, ecosystem with not a lot of investment experience. And there's two pieces of feedback that uh, you're probably gonna find. One, interesting, but let's talk when you have a million dollars in revenue. I, I hear this feedback from founders all the time. There's a perception that if you make it close to a million, that the risk is much less and it's a much better time to start investing. So how the heck do you ever get to a million dollars in revenue if no one ever wants to believe in you and invest that $500,000 that you need to grow your business to get to that point? So what that means is your job is to convince some of these potential investors to invest earlier than they might be comfortable doing so. And valuation is an important part of, of how you might do that, kind of like the story that Io told at the start of this meeting. The second thing you'll hear is interesting, but let me know when you have a lead investor. And again, it's a major uh, problem in Alberta's ecosystem right now because there's a very few number of investors that will actually take the lead, write a big enough check, um, and be the first ones in to get the momentum running in that round. So again, your job is convincing people that may not be comfortable being a lead investor to come in early when you can't find one. And how do you do that? Again, valuation is an important tool that you can use uh, to encourage people to do that. Some of the more practical uh, um, reasons why uh, valuations matter so much, it creates a first, a first impression. You know, if, you, if I talk to you and you tell me that your pre-seed stage company, you've got $10,000 in revenue and you wanna raise money at a $6 million valuation, I can tell that you haven't done your homework, you're not prepared. Um, it's probably not a reasonable number. And so the first impression that you create is, is uh, reflective of, of that. And you know, you might, some investors will definitely use that as a screening tool. So, uh, you know, manage that first impression, do your homework. Um, setting the foundation for, for future rounds. So 
We'll get into this more with some examples later, but you really need to understand that the, the valuation you raise capital at today sets the tone for the next raise in a year or two. And the one after that, that might be another year or two down the road. It's not just about today and bigger is better and higher valuation is, is better. If that number is too high or too low, you might severely impact your ability to raise money in the future. Um, <clears throat> setting the right valuation will also attract the right investors. You know, if you want a sophisticated, experienced, full-time investor that can add a lot of value to your company uh, after the capital is raised, then, you know, making sure that valuation is reasonable and in the right ballpark, uh, it's going to go a long way to furthering those discussions. If you are of the feeling that, you know, you just need to raise as, at a high a value as possible, you might be able to do it. You're probably going to find people that aren't as experienced and, and informed and they might write a check, but, you know, you're, you're probably not going to get a lot of expertise to come with that after the money. So you need to think about what kind of investor that you want to have in your business. And again, it's, it's a long-term relationship. So think carefully, right? And finally, you know, it just, it does ensure both immediate and long-term success of your startup by getting today's valuation, right? Because like I said, it's going to set you on a path for the future. That's, it's going to last through the next, you know, three to six years and, and, and beyond. <clears throat> so we'll talk about now uh, a couple of, key factors that uh, are really at play here in Alberta and influencing valuations. And so uh, my little picture here is meant to show, you know, a lot of hands reaching up and looking for money and a small pile of, of money. Um, you know, we do have a lot of wealth in Alberta, but again, like I said earlier, in our tech ecosystem, we don't have a lot of um, investors willing to participate at the pre-seed stage. There's a lot of companies looking for money. There's very few investors that are willing to make those investments at the early stage. Um, so what that means is that an investor like us, we don't compete against other investors. If you compare that to, say, a Silicon Valley, there's a deep, rich history of angel investing and pre-seed stage funds. They're all competing for the same deal flow. One of the factors that's at play there is they compete against each other. They want to move faster or they'll compete by offering a higher valuation on your business. It doesn't happen here. Um, we have to collaborate and pull other investors in at the early stages. Um, so it's an important factor to consider. And just to give you an example of, of what I'm talking about here, uh, in 2023, there was about $750 million of venture capital invested in Alberta. Of that, only 5 million was invested in 11 pre-seed rounds. So 5 million in 11 pre-seed rounds. That means 11 companies got about $500,000 each in that pre-seed stage, $250 to $1 million. It's not a lot of money, especially when you think in the context of we have about 1,200 pre-seed stage startups in Alberta, the way I've defined them. So that's about half of our entire ecosystem. So you, you can tell from, from those numbers that there is a severe shortage of pre-seed stage capital. So when you talk to other founders or colleagues that you might have, Toronto and the States, different markets that are more advanced, they're larger, they have more access to capital. Those are factors that are definitely at play uh, in valuation. And, and we'll, we'll touch on that a bit more later. Second thing, and probably this is um, some, a more practical takeaway is, is, is simply risk. You know, more, more risk identified by an investor means probably a lower valuation. And so what are some examples specifically of of what that means and how it might impact your business because you know you might all say yes i'm a b2b software business but there's a long range of risks and things that are very different about each of you so some examples you know are you first-time founders again most are right now or are you repeat founders that um, build a company together had a successful exit have more experience to bring into your second time around very different profile are you a single founder, uh, have to wear every hat by yourself, or are you a team of two to three uh, with a, a, a nice uh, diversity of, of experience? Have you been in business and in the industry for three to five years or something like 10 to 20 years? So, you know, there's a lot of uh, learned and lived experiences that are, that are different with that, with, uh, with that range of experience and different risks to go with it. Um, is your go-to-market strategy based on assumptions because it's early, you haven't gone out and tested it yet? Or have you actually been out there, trialed and erred, talked to some actual customers, got some feedback and adapted your strategy? This is a really important one. There's a big difference between assumptions and actual real market feedback. Have you launched a, an MVP version of your product, Or have you 
uh, had your product out there and you've got paying customers that have been giving you feedback on it for three months, six months, a year, it makes a real big difference in, in the risk that an investor might see. And again, uh, I think I touched on it already, but maybe you don't have any paying customers yet, which is okay. Um, or do you have paid pilots or actual annual contracts in place? So all those things add up to a very different risk profile. And those risks will weigh heavily on how we see uh, valuation and how we're prepared to move forward with founders. So uh, we'll, we'll move on and touch on some, some broad guidelines before we get into a couple of specific examples. Again, I think I've touched on this, but make sure you understand the local market dynamics. So do some homework, uh, talk to others that have raised money locally. You really need to understand what's happening in Alberta if that's where you're going to raise money. <clears throat> Spend the time that you can to build the traction to support your valuation. Many will tell you, you know, the best uh, answer to valuation and raising capital is, is sales. And, and it, it really is true. But traction doesn't have to be just sales. It might mean early potential customer partnerships that are giving you great feedback on your products and helping you figure out where to where to pivot and where to take it. There's a lot you can do with uh, with traction that doesn't necessarily have to just be hard, hard revenue, but there's got to be a balance between traction and, and valuation when you get to that point. And given the context I gave you with how hard it is to raise money, just make it easy. Do everything you can to make it easy for potential investors to say yes. So valuation, deal structure, those are two important tools to do that. Um, and we'll touch on those a little bit later. <clears throat> Uh, again, I think I've touched on this also, uh, you know, bigger is not always better. Uh, you'll see uh, some specific, specific examples in a couple of minutes, um, but you need to set yourself up for success in the long term with the valuation at the pre-seed stage because it's going to be with you through those seed stages and, and beyond. And finally, um, there's sort of a rule of thumb that says once you get out there and start raising money that you should expect to dilute your ownership as a founding team by up to 20 to 25% in that pre-seed round, that seed round, that round that comes after. Um, so that's a really important thing to keep in mind. That impacts your whole fundraising strategy and your valuation. And I'm going to give you a specific example uh, about that so you can understand. But that's uh, something I would I definitely keep that in mind as you go forward and plan to raise money. <clears throat> so before we get into those examples, you know, the, the the theme today is what's my company worth? I'm going to give you kind of bookends on how we see valuation. If you're in Alberta and you're in the pre-seed stage and you're in sort of that profile that I, that I laid out, you know, I would suggest, broadly speaking, your, your valuation is going to be somewhere in that $1.5 to $3 million range. Now, there's a lot of variables that play in those risks that I mentioned that could pull that up, that could pull that down. Um, there's a ballpark for you to start with. Um, but again, just remember this: that this stage is more of an art than it is a science, and so we, um, you know we need to consider all those factors that we've discussed so far. Um, and I'll give you a specific example now of uh, dilution and how it might have uh, how it might play into that valuation. So, let's say you're a B two B software company. You're based in Alberta. We agree that you're worth $2.5 million today pre-money, which means prior to the transaction where you're going to raise some money. <clears throat> you decide to go out and raise $625,000. You think there's a story that will say we can achieve such and such milestones, build some good traction if we can raise $600,000. So let's go ahead and do that. Fast forward to the end of that transaction. We've raised that $625,000. The value of our company post money, which, which means the pre-money valuation of 2.5 million plus the $625,000 that we raised. So that post money value is 3.125 million. Those investors that put in the $625,000 now own 20% of your business. So simple example, um, but that's very common of how we see companies raising money here in Alberta. And uh, so you might be asking or might be thinking to yourself, well, I wanted to raise a million and a half dollars because you see people in other ecosystems doing that at the pre-seed stage. Well, you know, if you doubled this raise from 625 to 1.5 million, you're going to end up diluting yourself by over 40% and you're quickly going to run into a problem um, because you'll find that later stages investors will think that you don't own enough of your company anymore. So this is where it gets into a bit of an, an art and balancing these kinds of things. But 
this is a great example. We've invested just like this several times and see this approach very often in the, in the market. I'll give you now a very specific example uh, from our own portfolio of a company that uh, we invested in in 2022. It's gone on and raised uh, a follow-on seed round and is now looking at raising uh, another round um, as we speak. So this company, um, B2B SaaS business in 2022 had about $250,000 in revenue. So this blue line is revenue in 2022, it's $250,000. Went out and raised $1 million at a $3 million pre-money valuation. So you do that math, they gave up 25% ownership in this round. From what I've told you about making it simple and valuation, our opinion, they made it very simple to raise money. They probably could have tried to push that valuation to three and a half or four and negotiated and taken more time to do that. They decided they wanted to keep this process as tight and quick and short as they could. We're very reasonable in investors' eyes and that transaction was done fairly quickly. So fast forward the year about a year and a half later, <clears throat> revenue had grown to just under a million dollars and growing fairly quickly, had an opportunity to raise some more money and raised a million and a half dollars with some new investors, larger investors came on board. Valuation at that time was $8 million, which was about double what it was in that pre-seed round, um, which is a great success. That's kind of a, a benchmark that you can think of. If you can double your revenue and double your valuation from one round to the next, um, good rule of thumb to keep in mind. It's hard to do, but um, it's something to, to think about. Um, so a successful raise, again, dilution just under 20%, in this round as well. Fast forward to today and there's discussion ongoing about a potential $5 million raise in revenue in their last year was 2 million growing quickly. They're gonna probably even double that in the next year. Um, you know, the potential to raise money at an 8 million, sorry, excuse me, $18 million valuation is there. So based on their last year end, that's sort of an eight to nine times multiple um, on their revenue for valuation. Great story. I want to leave you the example because this is what happens when things go really well, is that you can have that double, you can raise money successfully, uh, but this is definitely an exception. It's not, it's not the norm. It's hard to do this, you know, and, and uh, what happens often along the way is that, you know, there'll be some bumps in the road, the road and that valuation won't double. Um, and it means it's harder to raise money. So back to my comments earlier, if this company would have raised money at a $6 million valuation in its pre-seed raise, got out to the market, built up a million dollars in revenue and found they were found they were worth $8 million, it's going to be a hard amount of money to raise. You're going to have investors that aren't happy because they haven't seen much of a gain despite the large growth of the company, right? So um, it's a practical example. We can ask questions about it later. Um, the other thing to think about is once we get to this stage where there's about $2 million in revenue, the kind of revenue multiples that you hear people talk about for valuation start to apply at that stage. So if it's six or eight or 10 times revenue, it really starts to make sense at this stage, not, not at an earlier stage. Um, and we'll, we'll touch on that uh, in a minute as well. Uh, so I guess I thought I would give you an, an example of some data that really um, can be used to drive valuation even way back at this pre-seed stage. <clears throat> if we think about, publicly traded companies. Uh, there is an index out there that tracks the valuation of uh, publicly traded B2B SaaS companies. Uh, and so this is the source. Uh, there's a website address here. If you wanna go find the source of this data, do they have a bit of a guide if you really wanna get into details on, on valuation and how they see it for larger companies. So this index is built of companies with at least 2 million in revenue. <clears throat> um, and this is the revenue multiples that they're trading at on a public stock market. So the thing to take away today, 6.9x is the average at the end of October. You go back to 2020, early 2021, those were in the 16 to 18 uh, X range. So they've come down a long ways. And, you know, I would suggest that you would expect this is the normal today. Um, Again, this is really focused when you've got $2 million in revenue and beyond, but I want to sort of work backwards into those pre-seed stage valuations, knowing what we know about what's happening in the public markets. How can we, how can we take that and help us understand valuation of a pre-seed stage company? So in this example, 
let's start here on the right at step one. Let's pretend you grow your business in four or five years to $2 million in revenue. Based on what I just showed you, we might think it's worth seven times its revenue, $14 million pre-money. That's this blue bar, okay? <clears throat> we know that ideally we want to think about doubling revenue and doubling value from one round to the next. So let's back up one round to step two here where we had about a million dollars in revenue. Uh, maybe we did a raise at a $6 million valuation, uh, raise some money. We had a valuation post money. I don't want to get too detailed, but point being, if we cut the valuation in half from this seed two back to the seed stage, we were at about a $6 million pre-money valuation. <clears throat> and if we go one more step back, again, we know we want to double the, double the valuation, double the revenue, cut those in half going back to the pre-seed stage. Here's an example of a company with 150. This is how I would look at a company like this. If it had $150,000 in revenue, 2.5 million valuation pre-money, um, I went out and raised $750,000. Again, we've done that several times. <clears throat> this sort of lines up with what I gave you earlier that the company in our portfolio executed on. This is, we've, we've taken a valuation at the pre-seed stage. We've grown the business successfully. We've doubled to that seed stage. We've grown for a couple more years and, and doubled again to that point where we know where those market revenue multiples really apply. So you can see, we kind of end up back in the same place using what we know about public markets. We're ending back up in the same place as the examples that I've given you earlier. So, you know, you can look at it as a bit of science. We can talk about it as, as more of an art. There's a couple of ways to approach it. There's lots of rules of thumb, no hard and fast uh, guidelines there. Um, but uh, again, I would just keep in mind, this is, this is the goal, this is the dream for companies to get onto this path. It's the exception, it's not the norm. There's a lot of hiccups along the way. And so all the more reason why we need to be careful with how we value our company at a pre-seed stage. If it's too high, it's gonna be really hard to raise money later. I've seen companies that gave away almost half their ownership at the pre-seed stage, which makes them uninvestable uh, following that as well. So there's a lot of things to consider. Hopefully I've given you uh, a good outline and, and some pieces to think about. I think with our time now, Io, um, we can probably turn it back to questions and see if uh, any of these pieces uh, resonated and we can dive into any questions that people may have. Great, uh, thanks, Brian. Uh, so for, for the Q&A session, we have the uh, Q&A tab um, on the meeting uh, on on the Teams interface, uh, it's separate from the chat section, so you can put your questions on the Q and A. I will try to go through as many of them as possible. Um, so I want to start with a question. Um, there is no shortage of advice in the ecosystem. We know that, right? So yeah. we hear so many people sharing so many opinions about different things, and um, I think one that has caught my attention recently is people say defer the conversation around valuation. Don't talk about it yet, uh, especially when you're pre-revenue. Um, just talk to investors. If they're willing to give you money, take it, and then walk your way back from there. Um, what are your thoughts on that? That's a great question. I mean, it's a common one now. Um, I guess, you know, my first question would be uh, often the people giving that advice are not the one that are writing the checks. Uh, so you got to be careful where that advice uh, comes from, right? Um, back to keeping it simple to raise money. So uh, for some for some types of investors, so let's, let's take a, a very common example where we would invest in a company. Let's say I meet you today. I want to get to know you and build a relationship for six months before we're ready to invest. Um, but you might need some capital before that. And you've got an angel investor or two that might put in $25,000. You need, you need that money, you can put it to work. I would say absolutely get it, take that money. Maybe the easiest way to do that is a safe note or a convertible note. Um, and it's, I, I, would, I see it as sort of a short-term uh, solution because um, we like to, we do this full-time and we believe we understand how to assess risk. And so I want to be rewarded for the risk I take today that's gonna to help you build your business over the next two years, right? So maybe a, a simple example I often give is, you know, would, would you go buy a house in a brand new neighborhood and you're the first house that's built there, but you're gonna to agree to pay for that house in three years at the price at the time when the whole neighborhood's developed? It doesn't sound like a good deal. And that's that's kind of how I feel about safe notes sometimes. I think there's a, 
there's a practical time and a place for them. Um, depends on the investor, depends on what they like to do, depends on the details in the note and the valuation cap in particular is a really important one. We like to put a price and a value on a company because we believe we know how to assess risk and we lean, lean in pretty heavily to help as much as we can after the capital has gone into. So I, I would rather just, and, and we're not alone in that in that um, thinking, we, we'd rather crystallize the price today because um, we know there's certain risk on the table. We're going to help mitigate that risk and grow the company. And so why not reward an investor? And so think about the audience that you're speaking to. If you're speaking to people that know oil and gas, that know real estate, what the heck is a safe note is probably going to be a question that they have. Um, maybe you won't care if, if they know you really well and trust you and, and that's fine. Uh, but back to keeping it simple to get your raise done in the eyes of the people that will actually, you know, write a check and invest of your business. If they, if they like that instrument and they're happy with it, great. That's fine. Um, you just there's there's details. You we, you could have an entire webinar on on convertible notes and safe notes and you know pros and cons. Great, great. Uh, thank you. We have another question about um, some of the ways how other innovates can help startups and founders with uh, the valuation process. Um, I, I would say we um, it's a very great question, and we are currently having conversations around how we can provide this sort of support uh, for founders. Um, we wouldn't be there to give you value, but we can actually provide some, some guidance around getting you to go through that thought process uh, to reach in, um, evaluate band um, where you feel more confident uh, to talk to investors. So, um, I guess the short answer to that is we are considering it and thanks for bringing it up and um, you'll be hearing more from us about what that initiative would look like. Um, I have Maybe I can just, just, can I just add real quick? Sure. Yeah, um, I would just add that, you know, valuation can be, it can be art, it can be science, but ultimately you're worth what the market will pay for you, right? So sometimes you just need to get out there. The challenge that you have here in Alberta is, is finding enough investors to have that educated conversation with. I think with the audience that we're talking about, with the kind of wealth that we have here, they know enough to know when something feels a little bit crazy. You know, if it should it be 2 million versus 3 million versus two and a half, you know, I think their gut will tell them if they're in the right ballpark. Um, and they've got enough spotty sense and business sense to know if something seems a little bit crazy, right? So you just want to manage those first impressions, manage those expectations and uh, and test the market out. And, uh, you know, I've given you some very broad guidelines and um, think about those risks that that I talked about, because those are very different for every company and are very real determinants of, of uh, you know, how we see a company's chance to succeed and, and therefore valuation. Can't hear you, Ayo. I can't believe we're still doing <laughs> <the way> you. <laughs> uh, another question here. Um, how would investors treat grants received by a company they're looking to invest in? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, grants are, are amazing potential source of capital. Um, you know, they, they typically have a matching component. So you you probably still need to think about how do you raise some money uh, and therefore potentially think about valuation in order to capitalize on those grants. I can tell you how we like to look at it. If you know, if you came to me and said, I need to raise $500,000, this is how I'm gonna use it. It's gonna get me from, from here to there and I can accomplish such and such milestones. I wanna understand what that path looks like with the money that you can control, which is the equity that you're gonna raise. There's some uncertainty in that grant process um, and some timing that we can't be perfectly clear about. And so if those grants aren't secured yet, I'd rather think of them as gravy. You know, if, if you raise 500 grand of, of, uh, of equity and you can hire a couple of people and you can do this, but if you get another hundred thousand dollars from a grant and it throws extra fuel in the fire and we could probably move faster, even better. You know, uh, we, we like to see companies, uh, make use of those grants. Definitely. I know it it's feels like a big suck of your time and trying to go through the process and manage all that, but uh, we think it's worth it. The founders in our portfolio uh, manage that, those processes themselves and have uh, have great success with it. I think, it, I think it's it's good leverage too. Uh, some investors look at that and, and they see that it it adds additional runway for for the companies they invest in, so could be viewed uh, more positively as well. Absolutely. Yep. 
Okay, another question for you. Uh, what does a solid cap table look like from an investor standpoint when you're getting to the seed stage or series A rounds? Uh, so there's good alignment between founders and investors. Yeah, that's a really good question. That's an important one. That's another webinar series right there is on cap tables. Uh, um, clean and simple is the shortest answer. Um, so if you have, you know, three founders, as you're getting close to that series A, if you have three founders that own a little over 50% of the company still, that'd be, that'd be great. 50 to 60%. If you've got, you know, some angel investors on the cap table from, uh, from your early days and maybe an investor like us or two that came in uh, along the way to help, help you get there and a bigger seed stage investor that came in. That's great. But I think the uh, clean is probably an, enough ownership by the founders that there's a meaningful um, stake there for, for them to want to stick with the company and, and continue to, to grow it in the, in the eyes of those potential investors. Um, and, you know, not a massive long list of investors that put in, you know, five thousand dollars each. It just starts to get the, the impression is that that will be a lot of your time to have to manage communication with all those people, and that might be a risk to investing in the company, right? So, I think a, a balance between uh, the number of investors, the sources of capital, and the type of ownership. If you've got safe notes and convertible notes that add layers of complication, uh, it can be a little bit difficult because as a founder, um, you might not know actually how much of your company you own given the some certain conversion uh, mechanism in those notes that um, that haven't been triggered yet, right? So um, we like simple, clean, uh, um, and best way I could describe it. Um, we know many founders uh, feel like investors in the Alberta shy away from um, hardware tech, um, tech uh, companies. Um, how do founders go about navigating that and being able to secure uh, private capital to to fund their projects yeah that's a, another great question um so when i had those those risks up um here's what i often say to to people is that you know raising money raising money is really hard i can't say that enough times it is hard so evaluation is important and i say that in the context of a bdb SaaS company if you have hardware it's even harder if you're a consumer marketplace it's even harder and in the hardware case, it's because you're more capital intensive. You have to raise more money. Um, and again, back to what kind of expertise do we have from our investment community here? I think the perception amongst the active investors is that there's a preference for B2B software or software. Um, hardware is a little bit less known. Uh, it's more capital intensive, therefore harder to raise the money. If you know, it could take you from needing five hundred thousand dollars to maybe needing two to $3 million on your first raise. And if it's, it's just, it's just hard, hard to do it. Right. So you got to think about those risks I mentioned. Um, and if there's a lot more capital at risk, how can you mitigate those, those risks in the eyes of that potential investor? And that might be having a uh, partnership, potential customer at the table, customers at the table, um, LOIs or, um, you know, something in place with customers that shows potential demand, for your product, uh, it doesn't have to be hard contracts, but there's ways to prove that there's demand in the market to help mitigate some of those risks. So I think you know that could be a big conversation too. But I would think about specifically the risks of having all that extra capital um, at risk in the company, and how how can you mitigate that uh, with the path to to revenue and go to market. Right. Difficult one though. There's no easy answer. Like on a, like I think with any emerging ecosystem, like we can't be good at investing in everything, right? So some things are just going to be harder and hardware and consumer marketplaces are two of those. Right. We're getting close to the um, time here, um, but I see a few questions and I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to summarize them and see if we can get an answer that will address most of them. Sure. And so, no, I'm sorry, just before you do that, I mean, I have time till one o'clock. Like if people want to stick around and, and you want to ask questions, it's fine. If you, if we need to end this, that, that's fine, but don't base it based on my time. I, I can answer a few more questions. 
Okay, perfect. Thanks for thanks for for that. Uh, so we'll officially end twelve fifty, so people can get back and and do whatever they need to do before they get back to to work at one. Uh, but then Brian will stay on um, between twelve fifty and one to answer additional questions. Uh, so you know, you 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 talked and 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 gave us this band, especially for pre revenue companies looking at pre seed rounds, um, or pre seed raises, uh, but not every company might just fit right into into yep. that box right if you're not a SaaS company or if you have patents for example um, so what are some of those factors or or tools that you know founders should be aware of when thinking through valuation that may you know take them maybe outside of that general band or keep them within that band based on uh, some of those factors or, or tools that they could leverage. Yeah, I think like things like patents are potentially great, right? Like, I mean, but it really depends on your ability to put them to use. And so I, I think the, the at those early stages for us, the most important thing that we're looking to evaluate is a founder's go-to-market strategy, right? And it doesn't have to be perfect. It's not going to be perfect. There's still going to be a lot of learning there. Um, but, you know, if you've got a... You know, heavily patented product, but don't know how to sell it or who to sell it to, and can't find your way to customers and a story that resonates with them. Then it's not really, it's not really that valuable in in our eyes, right? So, um, I think that's probably the you know the team. I would say that the team, the composition of the team, um, and it's cliche to say that, but let me let me maybe dive into that a bit deeper. So, yeah, we have a couple of companies that have a single founder in our portfolio. We watch that founder change multiple hats all the time. And just because there's only one founder, they do move slower. Uh, and there's just no way to move faster versus company our portfolio. And the example I showed you in those charts has a team of three founders. Uh, one is a developer, very experienced. One's a really experienced product development person. And the third is experienced at sales and marketing. Those are pretty three ideal expertise to have around the table as founders when you start your company. Uh, they didn't need to raise capital for a while because they had the, all the essential building blocks there. They just didn't pay themselves for a year because they didn't need to. So they built it up to the point where there was sales and customer traction. And like, that's a very real factor, right? Um, so I wouldn't discount that. If you've got a team that's got diverse experience uh, and uh, you can communicate that to, to, the, to investors, that's something you could push your valuation up out of that range because it'll allow you to move faster, right? For sure. Um, things like patents can do that as long as you got the, the support, you know, behind, like I said, a, a go-to-market strategy and, and uh, proving some validation and, and some kind of traction for your, for your product. It doesn't have to be hard and fast sales. Again, there, there's different partnerships and relationships and things that, that, that we could look at early on. Um, it's a matter of, can you convince the market that those are, or real signs or not. Hopefully that answers your question. I, I mean, that list of risks I had on the left, if you lean to the right on, on that column instead, all those things are gonna push your, your valuation higher. But we still need to consider the fact that, again, a company in our portfolio a year ago had a million dollars in revenue, went to market, raised at an $8 million pre-money valuation. So there's, there's still going to be limits there with what we know is happening in the one, one stage down in the market, right? You can't go out, you shouldn't go out and raise money at a $6 million valuation if you might only be worth six to eight in your next round. We, we need, if you do that, like some do it, but everything better go perfect, right? And that's a really tough ask. Right. Okay. Uh, well, um, Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, I think we we can maybe wrap up for now so people who want to stick around can can wait. Unfortunately, we couldn't go through all of the questions, but um, Brian has um, stated that he's happy to wait uh, behind after after the after we officially end this. And he also mentioned that he's happy to share his email address uh, in case anyone wants to reach out uh, directly to him to ask any specific questions. So thanks, thanks, Brian, uh, for that. But just want to say uh, thanks to everyone for for joining the webinar today. Uh, particularly, I want to I want to express my gratitude to uh, lots of community champions here who liked our uh, post, forwarded, shared, um, shared the the invitation links. Uh, really grateful for doing that. Um, we were able to have a really wide reach through this. 
Uh, I know this was um, a really short session about valuation. We actually have another session that we're going to be um, bringing, bringing to you soon uh, that will go deeper into valuation techniques. And I think that would also be a valuable session following this sort of introduction into the ideology or concept of valuation. Um, thanks to the amazing team here at Albert Innovate that helped to put this all together. And um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. And if you're okay to wait behind, please do. Um, we'll be sending out a link to <coughs> excuse me, a link to our survey. Uh, please fill out the survey. It's going to be very short. It will take you probably two minutes. And we'd like to get your feedback so we can plan future sessions. Uh, as well as we learn through this. So thank you again for spending your lunch time with us and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, I think that the biggest thing I just want people to take away from this, uh, because I have these conversations you know, weekly with founders, is that you really got to understand this is Alberta. Uh, this is a different ecosystem. It's a younger ecosystem, less access to capital. The way we raise money needs to be different to adapt to that. We can't go out and raise $2 million pre-seed rounds because we don't have valuations to support that. So it means we need to change our approach to how we raise capital. Uh, we can raise less, be efficient with it, tell a story of how we build traction and use that to raise more money uh, next time. And so uh, just keep that local context in mind. I know people talk to other founders and hear stories. And again, there are always exceptions and there might be that founder that flies down to Silicon Valley and is able to land an amazing deal, but you know, it's, it's probably one in a hundred and uh, you know, it's, you got to balance how you spend your time. You need to build your business fundraising and valuation. It can take over your life for six months and it'll take your eye off the ball of building revenue and, selling and customers and that's a real difficult thing to do early on so you need to keep a, a balance which means you're probably going to focus your fundraising efforts at home um, which again means you need to understand the audience and understand uh, who, you're, who you're talking to here and, and what their experience is with this type of stuff yeah yeah that's that's true and and it's just almost night and day how investors view um, investment opportunities in Canada versus the US. Uh, I know the founder went down to, uh, yeah, it was it was Silicon Valley. We're talking to investors looking to raise uh, 750 uh, US, about a million Canadian. And the investor said, uh, why are you in the US? Um, yeah. Investors in Canada should do that. That should be about one or two checks, uh, yeah. pre-revenue, um no no significant traction like yeah yeah that should be it but um yeah it's just, bringing that back here it's, it's just different you know it is and that's very real like that 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 what you just said um it happens so if you fly down to pick a city in the states there's going to be a red flag that goes up for that investor saying well what's wrong why haven't you raised this money at home if you can't raise it at home why should i consider investing in you uh, the reality is again is that it's hard to do that here it's not because not because you don't want to raise it at home um but it might just be because it's it's hard to do that right and it's not that we want to go slower it's that we're a younger ecosystem with less access to capital it's harder to raise money we need to raise less money to be able to do it successfully and that forces us sometimes to go a little bit slower until we can prove ourselves out a little bit more if you can get to that million dollars in in um in revenue and show that kind of traction north america is is your market for raising money next time around right and and that's when things really flip you have the leverage if you've got close to a million dollars in revenue a strong pipeline strong month over month sales uh, you could run a process and have a whole handful of, of uh, potential investors in Canada and even in the states that would be interested in you. But the reality is, is you just, and it's not just a, it's not just an Alberta and a Calgary thing. You go to any emerging ecosystem around North America, we all have these same problems in the early pre-seed stages. Is there's not a lot of experienced investors. We don't have, we didn't grow up here with a, a Microsoft or an Apple that was building employees who knew tech and have made money over the years to turn into angel investors. They, they do that in oil and gas, but we don't have that base in technology yet, right? So that, that's the reality of um, of the market that we have of potential investors. There are people out there. You got to network around and, and find them, but you, you really need to 
keep it keep it simple. And simple is reasonable valuation, recognizable deal structure, um, and build a relationship. You know, that's you know, we're not really, the intent of this isn't to talk about raising money necessarily, but we invest in relationships with people, and anyone that's going to invest in pre-seed is going to invest uh, in you, the people. Um, yeah, there's got to be a good business idea and a market there. But if I don't think you're the people that can execute and, and make this happen, then it's not going to happen. Right? So you need a relationship with those potential investors. And once you build that relationship, you can probably start to cross some of those bridges about, you know, maybe they're not experts in this space, but they know you, they like you, they trust you. Some of those barriers start to come down. All we need to layer in then is a good lead investor that can help uh, get them off the fence and and uh, and get things on their way, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. That's that's true. Um, w one thing again, um, your lead round, right, at Meticuli, which is really good. Um, or what what would be the typical roles of um, the the lead investor in a round? And uh, I think there's a question here as well about whether that investor needs to be the one taking the lion's share of the round. Yeah, typically that investor is the one writing the biggest check and, and in our case would be the first money in. So let's let's make an example of if your business wants to raise $750,000, you're early in the process. Imagine what it would be like going to the market and saying, hey, I'm raising 750 grand and I've got a fund that's putting in four hundred thousand dollars, right? It makes it a lot easier for you to find the rest of that money than saying, "Hey, I'm raising seven hundred and fifty thousand, and I've got fifty. Do you want to invest?" Right? So that's that's why you need a lead investor. Um, again, they're they're hard to find, unfortunately, here uh, locally. But um, our role in doing that is to get to know the people, build a relationship, understand what we're investing in. Uh, we like to know the business you know, just as well as the founders by the time that, that we invest. Um, and then beyond that, it means we're negotiating deal structure. So are we investing in common shares at a certain price? Is it some kind of a note? In our case, it's always going to, I won't say always, it's most often going to be uh, priced common shares. Um, we are leading the due diligence. Uh, you know, some of that is a formal process. Some of that's relationship building. And then we're sharing you know, we're sharing our insights and our knowledge with other potential investors. So if we put our money in, maybe the founder has five or six people that are considering putting 25, 50 grand in each. I mean, happy to speak to those kind of people, happy to share our due diligence report with those types of investors to help get them off the fence and um, and really help the dollars get flowing a lot uh, quicker and, and, and simpler. So, but deal structure and valuation discussion are the, are the big things. So if in our case, we were typically investing $400,000. Sometimes that's been 400 of four, a $400,000 round. Sometimes it's 400,000 of a, of a $1 million round. Typically you're the biggest. If, if you have a, the risk is if, you know, someone comes along and says, Oh, I'll put in $50,000, uh, but I want to do it at this price. Um, and you take that deal because you don't have any others. Well, you know, fast forward three months and you find someone that wants to put in $300,000 but doesn't like the terms from that little check that you got. They're going to want to undo that and, and uh, do it on their terms, right? So ideally, it's your largest investor, um, but there's no perfect uh, world here right now because, you know, you kind of have to pull pieces together as you can, and that's where it becomes more of an art than a science. Right. And do you um, do all the investors come in on on the same terms, or as a lead investor, do you get to set um, different terms for yourself, or you just set the terms for everyone else? Yeah, we set the terms for for the whole uh, whole round, so everybody comes in the same. You know, there might be a three or six month uh, window of time that's gone by in some cases when when the last investor comes in, but uh, generally that's not a that's not an issue because the you know, the company hasn't changed that much in, in those few months to make a meaningful difference. So, um, you know, everyone will be on those same terms for sure. Great. Great. Well, um, thanks to everyone that decided to stick around and, and listen, listen to us chat a little bit more. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and you can look me up on uh, look me up on LinkedIn, or you can find me through our website. Those are probably the two easiest ways to uh, reach out to me. And you know, I, I do my best to make time to talk to founders about this this kind of stuff outside of just these um, these kinds of forums. So it's hard to I can't do it with everybody, but um, you know, find your find your way to me if you can, and um, um, you know, do my best to have some conversations.
Right. Okay. So I pull back that comment about emailing Brian. That wouldn't be efficient. Look for Brian on LinkedIn or uh, contact Brian through their website. I think that would be most efficient to get Brian's attention. Uh, but thanks again, Brian. This has been very valuable, and um, I hope everyone was able to spend this time with us. Was able to pick pick something from the conversation today. Hopefully, yeah, it's a little little taste. There's lots of things that we could talk forever about in there, but it's a you know broad overview, and hopefully, some local context is what's most important there, and it's the piece that's often uh, missing in on the founders' case when they get out there. So we need to keep highlighting that and uh, and help everybody get up to speed on how how the market's working here locally. So thanks uh, very much for having me and uh, enjoyed enjoyed the time. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Okay. Bye everyone. Thank you. Okay. Bye.